very early morning, the railway yards at Wellington look almost romantic. Most of us in our heart of hearts cherish a nostalgic feeling about trains. But let's come in a little closer among the grit and noise and smoke and meet some of the people who work on the railways. Let's see something of how a day's work goes there. By sunrise, many of these people have been working all night and soon will go home for breakfast. Many of them will never travel beyond the railway yards. Oh, there's nothing romantic here, they'll tell you. It's just a job like any other. But it's a job that's dirtier than most, sometimes dangerous, always exacting. All the same, railway people speak of their jobs with a certain reserve of pride. No matter how small or obscure their individual work may be, they have the satisfaction of knowing that the community can't get on without them, and that they, in turn, have a responsibility to the community. At this early hour in the morning, the day's work in the depots is already half finished. Already, most of the trains are busy on the roads, bringing people to the city, taking them from town to town. In some senses, each railway worker has a part in every train that runs. The express which left Auckland 12 hours ago is their train, their responsibility, even though they work in Wellington. Running trains is essentially a cooperative business, and railway people have a clear sense of what that means. In the goods depots, the day's work takes a different tempo. It's broad daylight here before the loading begins. Thousands of wagons a year, millions of tons of goods. Statistics and figures don't mean much in terms of sheer physical labor and practical knowledge. The goods they handle are a reflection of the country's wealth. And in that sense, these men have a link with the life on the land. Even sale day is a special day for them as well as for the farmers. Like the proverbial housewife, their work is never done. There's always a fresh train load to deal with, a continual and unending flow of goods. It's lunchtime too in the hut workshops. Here's a different kind of railway life. These boys are apprentices to highly specialized trades. In the afternoon, they're attending their school. No matter what trade they're training for, to be fitters, electricians, boiler makers, carpenters, they must have a solid grounding in trade theory. Their apprenticeship course takes five years and they'll then be qualified as skilled tradesmen. But of course it's in the shops that these boys really learn their skill. Here's an engine being stripped down for a complete overhaul. Each part goes off to the gang which specializes in its repair. Finally, the stripped engine is swung down the shop to the assembly gang. And here's a newly overhauled engine coming out of the shops, bright and shining for another 80 or 90,000 miles of service. From the tradesmen who repair the train to the gangs who repair the train lines, the surface men. Their job is to keep the permanent way in good condition for the heavy loads it has to carry. Here, for example, they're adjusting the cant on the lines above the Waimakariri Gorge. people who work on the railways, the surface men have the loneliest lives. In some remote parts of the country, they see nobody but the members of their own gang for weeks at a time. Their only chance of social life is the visit to another railway community, perhaps 20 or 30 miles away. Such a community is Otera, a true railway town. They say even the dogs work on the railway here. Tonight there's to be a dance in the social hall, and the refreshment room girls are discussing the prospects. By evening, at the little stations and halts down the line, 
groups of twos and threes are waiting to be picked up by the slow train. One of the refreshment room girls is already off duty and ready to show off her new dress. Social functions of this kind go on wherever railway people live. Because of the difficult hours they work, because they're often moved from one locality to another, because these localities are so often isolated, they have to depend very much on the company of their fellow railway workers for their social life. And a very good life they make it. But while one lot of railway people are enjoying themselves at Oterra, others are preparing for a long night's work. Bill Fletcher is an engine driver at Tamaranui. At midnight, he has to pick up the southbound express and bring it down the line. This is a familiar scene in a railway man's house, as one member is putting on his boots and others ready to go to bed. And the wife cuts sandwiches and bottles tea at all hours of the day and night. The disruption of their home life is one of the most difficult things that railway people have to put up with. Engines are changed on the express at Tamaranui, so there's a good deal of preparation necessary before the train pulls up. The coaches are at the platform. To the passengers, a train journey is an upheaval, an interlude in their normal lives. They scramble for their cups of tea and sandwiches and copies of the evening paper, while the porters and pillow sellers and bookseller girls look after their comfort. And again. All seats. Welcome Express. Carry on, please. The express pulls out for the steep climb up the spiral. And as it steams through the blackness, the railway workers are doing the jobs that have become their lives. The passengers may work at desks, in factories and behind counters, but the train crew works on wheels. the train rushes, swaying through the night, through the sleeping towns and quiet farms, past ancient forests, leaving a trail of smoke and steam in the frosty night. It races through the King Country, through the Waimarino and the Manawatu, across the sleeping countryside to dawn in the cities. <laughs> 